Ba -ba -da -da -ba 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 Hi everyone, this is Rabbi Kenneth Hahn for Ask the Rabbi Thursdays, and thanks for tuning in to JUTV. Um, I said I was going to talk about a bunch of things today, dualism, the weather, and living in a state of grace. And um, I'm doing this because my colleagues weren't able to address Wisdom Wednesday yesterday, which is normally reserved for the week's Torah portion, or Parsha. This week's is Ikev. So I'm going to touch on that, but I want to encourage you, even if you're not all that into Torah and, um, and Divrei Torah, or, or words of Torah, to stick with me, because we won't spend a heck of a lot of time on that. So um, let's start with the weather. Why the weather? Because uh, in the last several days here in Northampton, we've had some pretty violent storms that actually came out of nowhere. And um, the weather, as much as anything, is a reminder that at least for now, we can't control what happens around us. We wake, you know, we consult our weather forecasters to see if it's going to be a sunny day or a rainy day. We tune into weather.com or Weather Underground or whatever your favorite weather app is because we really want to know about the weather because in no small way we want to control um, our circumstances and our environment. Uh, and that's something we've always wanted to do. And in fact, when we feel out of control and out of control in particular of our environmental circumstance, it can be pretty scary. And in some respects, I think that's what this week's Torah portion is about, although I don't know that this is an all that common interpretation of this Torah portion. Um, so uh, a little bit about the weather. What happens in terms of weather in this Torah portion? Well, what I want to call attention to is uh, how uh, God in tells us if we... Um, if we follow, obey God, Ikev actually means obey. So if we, got, if we follow God's commandments and rules and prescriptions and proscriptions for how best to lead our lives, among other things, um, when we arrive in the promised land, it will rain and um, our crops will grow and um, we will be taken care of. The universe, in a word, will take care of us. And that is put in stark contrast to how things were in Egypt. In the Egypt, or what I'll call the state of Egypt, and by that I don't mean the nation state, but the mindset of Egypt, um, the Torah specifically says we had to water the, um, the grain ourselves to make it grow. And so that's a stark contrast from how we're told it'll go in the promised land. And indeed, that is reminiscent of what our circumstances as a species were like living in the state of grace in what's called Eden in the Torah. Right at the beginning, we live in a state of grace. Of course, we uh, eat from the tree of knowledge and um, fall from grace quite quickly. And in my view, the Torah is really more than anything about how to get back to a state of grace with the new reality that we've eaten from the tree of knowledge. We have self-consciousness, we have self-awareness, um, we manipulate, we try to manipulate the world around us um, so as to, among other things, control our environment and alleviate our fear of what could happen to us if we don't control our environment. And that state of fear and anxiety is the furthest thing from a state of grace. Um, I want to call attention to a couple other things that are well-known um, uh, phrases from this Torah portion. One in particular that comes from this is, man does not eat from bread alone. and. Um, and this is a phrase that is widely misinterpreted from the meaning that was originally uh, attached to it in the Torah, clearly from context. So when we hear the phrase, man does not live by bread alone, sorry, um, we think of it as meaning physical food isn't enough. We need food for the soul. We need other kinds of things to feed us and nurture us besides bread. In the context of the Torah, what's going on is we are reminded by Moses that um, when we were in the desert, 
we didn't eat by bread alone. As a matter of fact, we didn't even have bread. We had to rely on the manna being rained down upon us by God in the desert when we were not in a position to grow anything. And um, so it's a very different kind of meaning. And again, it gets to this notion of um, we, uh, we need to, um, we best rely on the universe to take care of our needs rather than uh, living in this state of fear and anxiety that causes us to try to control our environment and truly every outcome. And from the standpoint of weather, uh, it's a scary prospect indeed if we could start to control the weather. We know what's happening now with weather patterns based on human behavior. And if we could actually decide, okay, well, it's going to rain here and not there, boy, that would be interesting and probably not pretty. Now, I did say I was going to talk about dualism as well. And, and I want to say a word about this because it's very interesting. In, in this Parsha, Ikev, there's a very dualistic notion of us and them. And it, it, in my view, comes up in a very specific context, which is this idea that we are now told you really need to rely on God, you need to rely on the universe, and um, otherwise you will live in a state of Egypt, and really what you want more than anything is to live in a state of grace. So don't do that. And the way you don't do that, the way you don't get to that state or mindset of Egypt is by following the commandments and um, sacred obligations, um, we, uh, avoiding the things that we're not supposed to do, doing the things we are supposed to do as outlined in the Torah, um, and that if we follow those, if we obey, if we obey those uh, ways of living, things will go well for us and we will again find ourselves in a state of grace. Um, the dualism comes in because, of course, and this is suggested all over this Parsha and indeed all over this part of the Torah, um, if we are subject to temptation and other kinds of um, uh, problems that, or challenges that might lead us away from leading a good and moral life, we will be very inclined to do so. So um, it is suggested that we wipe out those temptations and, and indeed the peoples and cultures that represent those temptations um, so that we won't be tempted and we will again lead a moral life. And um, that obviously is problematic. A lot of people have had a great deal of trouble with that, as do I. Um, it, it is true you know, if, if you're a diabetic, it's probably better not to spend your entire day either in a candy store or an ice cream shop um, because that's not going to lead more than likely to a good outcome and you're subject to these temptations all the time. That said, um, you can do everything in your power to eliminate temptation and it's still going to come your way because that's the nature of life. So ultimately, um, the work is not about annihilating cultures, different ideas, um, different anything that is likely to lead you away from what you believe to be a good and moral life, but rather to work on yourself and address your own demons and um, create the kind of inner strength, resolve, um, connectedness, whatever it is for you, that will allow you, even in the face of those temptations, to hold to your truth, whatever that might be. Um, so with that, I will say, um, have a great weekend, um, a wonderful Shabbat or otherwise day of rest and re restorative practice, and tune in next Monday for Music Monday. Lee Drowett, see you later.